uh, how building occupant networks actually uh, act within the buildings, how software can be used to connect these networks and actually reduce energy demand within the buildings, and then what the future holds. So, just by starting, I think a lot of people before Facebook uh, were kind of familiar with this notion of six degrees of separation. Basically, it's a small world, we're all connected to people through, well, I think the folklore is six degrees, like no matter what, we're, that's how close we are. Uh, this was basically an experiment done in 1970. One person basically sent out letters to about 250 random people with the intention of trying to reach some stockbroker in Boston. So basically, they gave the address, and if you didn't know the person personally, you try to send it to somebody you thought, you thought would know the person or has a better chance. But what he found was out of like 64 letters it reached, it only took about six different steps for it to actually reach the person, which is pretty, pretty radical uh, in terms of understanding that's how far this person was, just this complete stranger in Boston. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was notified that he'd be getting strange letters, but either way, um, it was a pretty interesting find. And now recently, we've been kind of moving that into the modern realm, and I know not many people are using Microsoft Messenger anymore, but this is a good study when it was popular. Basically showed people that are having conversations with each other were still around <clears throat> six degrees separated. From, like, this is across the entire world, an entire network of millions of people. I think it's maybe over 100 million people in the system. And in terms of one person being connected to someone completely random in the network, uh, that person, whoever they talk to, there's only about six degrees of separation there. So basically what that shows is we are connected and there's ways that we can use these connections to actually get things done and actually understand things about ourselves. And what that means is we can alter each other's behavior, we can influence each other's decisions to actually uh, purchase things, act certain ways, uh, do good, do bad. I mean, influence is influence, uh, no matter how you cut it. <coughs> and I'm sure we have a lot of personal exam examples of like adopting different technologies or, I mean, my most recent example is I don't watch TV, I don't watch a lot of movies, and I kept hearing about House of Cards, and I kept hearing how good it was, and I finally like got in the bandwagon and watched it, and was pleasantly surprised. And what that was an example of is the more people that I heard talking about it, the more I realized, you know, they probably are, they're saying something about this show, there's certain trust that I have with these people, they like the show, I might as well give it a shot. <clears throat> so the more people are talking about it, the more trust is communicated and the more likely we are to adopt the behavior. The second example is like adopting technology like Facebook. In the early days, it was kind of fun to see pictures of people. Uh, you didn't really know what was going on. A lot of people weren't signing up. They're like holding off. Specifically my parents, like, oh, we don't need Facebook. Like, <laughs> it's for young people. But uh, more and more as more people signed up, the utility of actually signing up and using Facebook increased where it was basically proportionate to the number of users using it is the more utility that an individual gains by using it themselves. So that's another example. <coughs> Rather than communicating trust, you're basically increasing utility by having more and more people link up in the network. So those are general examples, but they also apply to green technologies and things like that. So this is just a plot of the the number of sales of hybrid vehicles in different parts of the country. And it's, you can probably guess from the, just thinking about it, Portland has a very high concentration of vehicles, of hybrid vehicles purchased, followed by Seattle and San Francisco. And these are communities where, you know, conservation is a very big part of their lives. A lot of people are talking about it. There's a lot of influencing uh, of one another to actually act green, buy green, live green that kind of thing. So it's no surprise that there's a very high proportion <coughs> of individuals using hybrid vehicles, among other technologies. When you compare it to the US average, which is on way lower, uh, that just shows the effect of actual physical interactions, the word of mouth spread, and the diffusion of practices and decisions. So with that in mind, what we're trying to do as a research group is to see how we can actually use these social networks to reduce the energy consumption within buildings. So you guys are all very conscious of your impact on the environment. 
and you all live under work, <laughs> live, work, whatever, <laughs> under the same roof. Uh, and so you have a lot of influence over each other's decisions and actions. And within just a slice of energy in the U.S., buildings are 40% of all energy consumed in the United States. Uh, it's 75% of all electricity. So I think that works out. There's a few ways to actually approach building demand and consumption. Uh, a lot of them have been tried uh, and are still being used. Automated systems is one approach. Basically, how can you create a system that is a smart building system, knows what temperature things should be set, what lumens the lighting should be at. Uh, <coughs> these are all very, like, there's some very sophisticated, complex approaches, but a lot of the times, occupant comfort is kind of compromised. Uh, when lights are going off and you're late at the office or things are too cold because there's not enough people to, to make the warmth, a lot of people start complaining and that's not what we want as a, basically a tenant or a building manager. There's also expensive efficiency <coughs> upgrades where you can invest a lot of money up front, uh, hope things work out, but what we see is a lot of these amazingly efficient buildings that are being constructed around net zero principles are not achieving the kind of consumption uh, levels that they were built for. And people are wondering why, and there's a lot of studies showing that there's actually a rebound effect in the behavior of tenants, where if the lighting shouldn't matter, then why should I turn it off? It's efficient anyway. So what we're trying to do is stem that kind of rebound effect by targeting behavior modifications, basically the most fundamental aspect of um, demand. If we can influence behavior and basically lower demand or like basically the most fundamental way, then you can avoid costly upgrades or complement them. Um, and you can also integrate that into automated systems. So this is just kind of a breakdown about uh, typical energy use and electricity use in office buildings. On the left you see it's a plot for buildings in the, this region, the modern zone, the United States. Space heating is a pretty big component. Um, it's mostly gas. Uh, but once you start breaking it down in terms of energy, or electricity, sorry, specifically, uh, you see where a lot of gains can be made. And our system, at first, I'll, uh, I'll explain that later. But sorry, in terms of easy gains, lighting is a big one. Obviously, if we turn off the lights, that's a very easy way to uh, conserve energy. Uh, computers, office equipment, monitors, these are all kind of things that we have direct control over. They can very easily uh, control. And then secondary sources, refrigeration, uh, we don't have as much control over. And then ventilation, cooling, space heating. So in terms of in the individual impact, we can target the three main ones, which is a good sign. And then, then for electricity use, it's kind of a more of a group level interaction to see what's the most uh, what the optimal settings for a group. <clears throat> Two questions. The mm -hmm. source of the data. EIA, Energy and Information Administration. Is this regionally adjusted? Because it was always my belief that in Colorado, with this elevation, this location, yeah. the greatest energy use was going to be annual based heating, cooling, lighting, so, and then equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, so the graph on the left is regionally based. Uh, this one is just the uh, the overall sample of the United States buildings. Uh, I can find the electricity breakdown of this region, just the energy breakdown. So, big numbers, administrative offices in particular use a lot of energy, um, and it's got a big environmental impact. And basically, even marginal reductions, say 5-10% of savings, will have a big impact on a large scale. And that's kind of what we're trying to see is how, how much can we impact this through behavior. So designing a system to actually get this done, there's a lot of questions we have to ask. One is what motivates people to serve? Goal is a big one. So there's a study in 1978 around the first uh, energy crisis uh, where a lot of residential consumers were giving goals and under control studies they show that Moderate goals had a very good, big impact on reducing energy consumption at the residential level. Public commitment is another one. Uh, there are more software-based solutions, more, more recent, showing that if we commit to an action, actually let the public know, we're more likely to actually follow through. Uh, 
competition collaboration, this has been kind of a source and inspiration for our research. Uh, basically showing that people on an individual level and group level are more likely to actually act a certain way if they're being compared to another group or individual. And as long as it's being a positive reinforcement, uh, where this is kind of the, the core of the system that we're actually designing. Group identities have showed to not just yield energy savings, but also sustain them afterwards. So once the system is put in place, where people actually put in a group and work together to actually achieve a goal, once sort of the monitoring system is taken out, they'll show continued actual behavior change, uh, the sustained kind of uh, behavior that we're looking for. And finally, a little more surprising, a uh, study in 2008 in California showed that when you ask somebody, what is the biggest motivation to conserve, most people are going to say, oh, I want to be green, I want to, you know, environment is really important to us. Uh, and, well, when they actually compare those responses to actual changes in energy consumption in the presence of different information, they showed that that had a very marginal effect on actually changing behavior. Like, people thought green, but they did not act green. What had a significant effect was, saying that your neighbors are doing better than you. And that's when you have a lot of these bigger programs like O-Power, I'm sure you guys have heard of, are based off that study. <coughs> so again, with the theme of the talk, social networks, how can we actually incorporate all of these lessons learned into a program that basically utilizes social networks? So now coming into industry, uh, there's a lot of buildings, like I mentioned, that are built around these net zero standards, these certificates that are not achieving the, the kind of consumption levels that they're designed for. Uh, furthermore, there all have been some very successful behavior approaches and programs. Um, notably, Starbucks and the USPS. Starbucks introduced a, a green mandate a few years ago. And they've been seeing a lot of very good gains in terms of their energy savings, like creating stores against each other. Same with the Postal Service, uh, who's saved tons of money past couple of years, and they're both continuing to implement these programs and have their employees come up with a lot of the strategies uh, to save energy. The thing is, they're putting in these programs, but they're not realizing what factors are at play in terms of yielding savings and actually getting people to act a certain way. They have a point A and a point B, and they basically just, their entry analysis shows that they save energy. But they're not really sure why. Um, this is just a chart of different studies and industry initiatives that are using software now to, to connect people. Uh, as technology has been uh, evolving, prices have been dropping for modern technologies, we see more and more people are adopting higher frequency, higher resolution, basically a class level, individual level feedback uh, into the programs, yet very few actual studies are in a position to actually analyze the program. Uh, the, the gray dots are basically the academic studies, and as you can see, there's a dearth in the upper, upper right hand corner. So a lot of basically industries jump in the head without knowing how, how to actually analyze their programs. And our research group was basically created to fill that gap, the research gap. And in the past three years, we've been doing residential studies, and it's kind of my responsibility to lead it into a commercial domain. So our first study, uh, we started at Columbia University. Uh, we basically did a dormitory study where we connected a bunch of students over six floors and basically analyzed their interactions with one another over the computer system and applied a lot of computer science algorithms uh, to see what that was actually happening. Uh, we found that network effects, so basically when an individual has individual feedback of how much they're using, uh, versus when the individual has that feedback, but also what their peers are using, there's a statistically significant difference between the amount of energy that is saved over the course of, uh, of the program. Uh, furthermore, we also were able to identify and characterize the rebound effect. So once people started, were introduced to the system, there's a dip. Uh, after a few days, it start creeping up. Their energy usage kept that increasing until we reminded them that the system existed, <laughs> and it jumped on again. And we were able to characterize that, and basically we found out that the key to actually getting sustained savings was increased engagement uh, of users with the system, just to kind of increase their consciousness of their actions. 
Uh, we took that analysis a step further, uh, basically mapping out the actual structures of the individuals um, and their, the people that they're connecting with in the building. And we found uh, that the more people an individual was connected with, uh, the more savings that they were actually going to um, achieve. And we also saw that in terms of how essential they were to a network. Basically, if there's many individuals connected to one another, uh, the one that kind of lies in the middle of that social network has more influence on the other's actions uh, than the ones on the periphery. And basically, we just threw in a lot of uh, statistical analysis to show that once a person clicks, somebody, if that person is using less or more, it didn't really matter, uh, they were more likely to reduce energy consumption over the next day, which basically reaffirmed our hypothesis that increased engagement is the best way to actually achieve the sustained savings. And we found this to be consistent um, across all users in the network, uh, as well as we controlled for different factors in terms of whether or not people are having the same schedule schedules or they be reducing that kind of thing. We made sure to, to actually control for all those. So we proved that network position has sorry, influence on um, actual engagement with the system as well as the end conservation uh, gains made by the individuals. So now we're moving forward into the commercial space. And I mean, we're very happy that there's been a big push on the federal government, uh, despite the recent sequestration, uh, to actually push initiatives that are helping commercial buildings as well as eco districts. So we're kind of step one of our grand vision, which is to incorporate a lot of occupant comfort metrics, not just energy, but also how comfortable you are in terms of temperature, humidity levels, lighting. We want to show, actually, a study how networks of individuals kind of dispersed through a building actually influence each other's, not just energy, but also their, their comfort levels. Whether or not, uh, if we're all wearing sweatshirts and a few degrees warmer, or not, we can influence that kind of behavior. Uh, we're definitely interested to see that. Uh, and then we're also working with a few companies out in Portland who are looking to do expand this kind of research into an eco district level. So I know you have like an EPA down the street. Jeff has mentioned some other very progressive companies here. We're interested to see how companies kind of work together uh, to actually achieve the kind of conservation gains uh, on a regional level rather than just a single building. So the first few questions that we're going to be trying to address in our research is one, do network dynamics that we observed have an impact in residential settings? Does that, does that apply in commercial settings? Uh, we're going to test whether social organizational networks have a bigger influence. So basically, if you're connected to friends at the Lyon Center or connected to basically your workmates, how does that kind of impact your interaction with each other over the system as well? Uh, the conservation. So we want to see how energy uh, conservation practices diffuse through the types of networks. So, sorry, we want to see when people actually create or come up with an idea to conserve energy that might not have been known before, like a, an easy way, um, whether that's directly or indirectly applicable to the system, how you'd like to work, for instance. Um, how does that idea gain traction through an organization and actually become adopted to others within the organization or within the building. Uh, then we're, your alliance building is a very interesting case study for us because we see how things might diffuse organizations, not just, not just within the organization. So that gives a very good platform for this kind of analysis. Uh, next, we want to see when we actually give this information to people, what are people interested in? Are they interested to see how much they're personally usually using or are they interested to see uh, how others are using energy, or, or are they more interested to see their actions being tallied against other people uh, that might not be directly comparable? Uh, so we'll be kind of doing a lot of interface studies to see what are three or four very like, basic <coughs> metrics that we can distill all this information into that people can act on uh, most easily and intuitively. So that's what we created a, a software platform to kind of collect data help us answer these questions. And basically, the way on a high level this works 
is we're going to have desk monitors installed throughout the building uh, that allows individual energy consumption to be monitored, pushed through an internet server onto the software interface where you'll be able to compare your energy with others, uh, as well as come up with ideas and collaborate with other people within your organization or across organizations. Uh, and basically, you'll be constantly able to compare plug load as well as just actionable data that's not captured by these plug load models. And we're interested to see are the net effects effects of introducing the system. And you'll be you'll be connected with individuals within your group as well as us across the organization. Uh, so you can kind of see how uh, your your firm is kind of compared to others uh, relative to baseline. And that's coming soon. And right now, um, there's three of us kind of in charge of implementing the system. Uh, it's me, my professor, <coughs> and Rishi, who stayed in New York for the time, and we'll get him out of there. And we'll be coming here soon. So that's, that's kind of the high-level approach that we're taking. I'm definitely happy to answer some more of the questions that you guys might have in terms of, please. Could you explain to me in later terms how I'm going to be able to see our organizations that are using how I'm going to be able to compare it. So I can show you a screenshot of okay. what it looks like. So there's basically three main views. This is the first individual view. Basically, your energy consumption, uh, basically your desk load based on uh, your power strip or whatever and working with on that, uh, it's going to populate the main plot here. And you'll be able to track, in the initial version, we won't have disaggregation of appliances because of monitoring limitations. Uh, but your aggregate desk consumption will be displayed in the graph here. And you'll be able to toggle on and off other people that you're connected to over the network. So that's going to be determined whether by uh, whether you're connected to an organization, a larger one, or group of organizations to work together. So we'll allow, we'll allow up to eight different comparisons at one time uh, on this. And to be clear, we're not really expecting that this is going to be where all the gains are coming from. This is basically just to bridge your actions to actual energy consumption. We want to create this link of consciousness that your energy doesn't matter. Uh, now the second part of it, actually before I get that part, and then within a group level, We'll have normalized data, so different groups of different sizes, you can compare your consumption to their consumption as well. So you're connected to seven people here, another group is maybe 20 people here. You'll be able to see how individuals are uh, the energy on that scale. Now the second part is where individuals are connected to come up with different ideas. Uh, and now it's kind of like a Facebook wall. I guess, where a system administrator can come up with a few recommended actions. Where individuals uh, kind of see this day in and day out when they're logged in. Uh, on the other end, an individual can come up with their own ideas. And once that happens, the new ideas will, will pop up. People can discuss, like, um, and actually uh, check, which means that they've actually performed the action. And we may check the popularity of ideas, see how idea might become more popular popular over time through the organization. And as a system administrator, you can kind of very pick different actions from here and throw them on here. And then as an individual, every time I check something, say I turn off the bathroom or I run my bike to work or um, turn down the temperature somewhere, uh, you can actually, actually you click a check here, and then at least for the recommended actions, you can directly compare your actions over time with other people. So basically this kind of just creates a, a setting where if you're competitive with another group and you want to see if you, you turn off the lights before they do, I mean, you can throw some compromises, obviously. Uh, but this kind of gives you the incentive to actually take notes of your own actions and record those. And we'll be tying a lot of the analysis with the submeter data that the Alliance is already collecting to see how truthful people are uh, and basically just we'll see what the net impact is of 
idea diffusion. So what makes an idea popular, gain popularity? Why are people discussing a certain idea? How is it jumping from one firm to another? These are the kind of things that we're going to be looking for. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So it's a plug level direct comparison, and then uh, basically shared resource indirect comparisons that we're going to be tracking through the system. You just log into a web page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is all hosted on our server and things logged in. 